about 15 minutes ago, you mentioned that Dalvanson was not approved for your hospital because it was $4,000 a pop. Now, if this was a socialized um, country, as per Canada or Israel or England, would it be easier to get this drug? And, and also, how come drugs cost so much money here and so little money uh, elsewhere? So the question was, with socialized medicine, would we be, have more access to these drugs? The answer is no. So I see a lot of patients who get a, ended up in my emergency room because they're on an experimental cancer therapy. They are getting something which costs $30,000 a dose that may extend their life by a few weeks and then it doesn't, and it wreaks havoc on their immune system. In my, my med school roommate lives in Sweden, and he said, we wouldn't even consider giving these to people. So our very, very, very flawed healthcare system does provide access to drugs that you don't get in other places. Um, whether that's right or wrong, I can't say, uh, but you would not be talking about the economics of Dalbavancin if you were in, in the European Union. Um, and I will say that what we find is that in certain conditions, let's say breast cancer, we're far more willing to pay for a drug which will extend life by a few months than we are in infectious diseases, where a drug may extend life by a few months for a few thousand dollars and we won't pay for it. Yeah. Oh, I have the microphone. Okay. Uh, hi. Thank you. Uh, my name is Barbara. I'm a midwife and I'm a former nurse at Presbyterian. And I'm very proud of you. I'm very proud of the work you're doing. Thank you very much. And the question I have is, could you comment on Josh Axe's uh, idea of eat dirt and don't wash the organic dirt off the carrots and, and that sort of, it, in other words, can you tell us ways to protect ourselves? Yes, I would love to have a, a mic I can walk around with, but I, I don't know if we have one. So the question was from a, a former midwife at New York Presbyterian. Um, about this idea that you should eat, eat dirt, leave some of the, the rind on carrots and things like that. Um, so let me back up and just say as a midwife, my, my wife gave birth at New York Presbyterian and I have seen some of the most difficult and challenging things you could possibly see in medicine and nothing fazed me until my child was born and I almost passed out, and I was so unsteady that I couldn't cut the umbilical cord. So I admire what you do. Um, the question is about how should we expose ourselves to these pathogens? And there is an article that got a lot of play, a lot of circulation that said, the title of it was, Let Your Kid Pick His Nose. <sighs> the truth is, it doesn't help us to raise children in sterile environments. I grew up in Alabama. I grew up playing in the backyard in a dirty uh, sand box where people were peeing and doing gross stuff. Uh, and I don't get as many infections now. And I've often wondered, is there a connection or is it maybe I just luck of the draw? I do have a plant-based diet myself and maybe that's actually helping me. But there is a lot of, uh, there is a belief that, can you hear me on this one? that if we do expose people to some pathogens early in life, that could be a good thing. But I will say there are severe caveats. When I was a kid, I went to chicken pox parties. I don't know if anyone else did this, but the idea was to transmit the virus, get it early on. We don't do that anymore. So I am hesitant to encourage people to get in harm's way, <laughs> but I'm also don't think you should be overly picky. So the challenge is how do you find a middle ground where you live essentially a life where you're getting exposed to things but not to too much? Uh, and I don't have an answer for that. So I'm gonna just say that it's a struggle I have. I have two young kids uh, and the other day I was sitting on the couch, my wife is, does kidney transplants for a job and we looked over and my son was picking his nose and then he ate it. My wife looked at me and goes, maybe it's good for him. So I don't know uh, is the short answer, uh, but we are wrestling with that as parents and as doctors. So thank you. 
My question is related to the lady before me, and it's about immune system. Why 50% of these people got candida auris survive and the other one didn't? Because in the previous presentation, we heard that our immune system really has been lowered, the power to it's fight been... sickness, lowered. You know? Yeah, so a great question, which is, so it sounds like it's a, she was asking, it's like a coin flip if you're going to survive from Candida auris 50-50. One of the things we find, and one of the things I'd like to stress, is that if you have a normally functioning immune system, you don't need to worry about superbugs. But, how do we answer the question of whether you have a normally functioning immune system? That is a really hard thing to answer, and it begins with a conversation with your doctor. And if your doctor can't answer that question, then maybe you need a new doctor. Because so many of the people that I see who end up in the emergency room with a superbug infection either have a medical condition that weakens their immune system and they don't know it, or they're on a medication that weakens their immune system and they don't know it. A lot of people are prescribed prednisone, for example, for arthritis, for all kinds of things. And at higher doses, that wreaks havoc on your immune system. And some people don't know that. And so it begins by just asking your doctor. And as I said, I am face to face with superbugs every single day of my working life, and I'm not walking around sick all the time. And it's because I have a normally functioning immune system. But as I write in my book, my father-in-law got cancer, he got on chemotherapy. And we immediately started treating him differently. I stopped shaking his hand. I stopped giving him big hugs, and I told him, you can't go into our moldy basement anymore because there are so many different places that had hazards. And so it's knowing about the risk profile for every person. And that's something that I do not want to have the onus be on you to figure out, but you should be in the care of somebody who can tell you. I have um, a question for you regarding vaccines. How do you feel... What can you tell us about the um, HPV and the flu vaccines that are? Mm. Great question. So I could do an entire talk on vaccines, uh, but I, I believe someone else will probably be covering that topic. It's a very controversial topic. Um, I ran into this a few years ago when I wrote an article. I used to write for a website where I had a weekly column, and I talked about how they have to basically guess every year with the influenza vaccine what strains to put into it. And the way that they make the influenza vaccine every year, and I'll get to your question about HPV in a second, is that they try to predict based on what's happening in Australia, which is six months ahead of us, and say, okay, so here are the strains of influenza in Australia when it's their winter. Let's try to make something similar. But the process, which involves using eggs and is a really weird, archaic process, doesn't always work out the way we hope. And I wrote an article about that and how we didn't guess right one year. And the, the article, they slapped a, cl a clickbait headline on it, which was, why does the flu vaccine suck this year? And I got accused of being an anti-vaxxer who must be related to Jenny McCarthy, the prominent anti-vaxxer, I'm no, no relation. And I realized then, this was four years ago, that I have to be very careful about the way that I talk about vaccines. Um, the question was about the HPV vaccine, which is something that can prevent cervical cancer and can also prevent anal cancer. One of the reasons I went into infectious diseases, if you go to medical school, the first thing they ask you is, are you a thinker or a doer? Do you want to be somebody who does procedures, who is a doer, surgeon, or do you want to be somebody who's thinking all the time, coming up with new treatments for high blood pressure? And I found that I was more of a thinker. My previous life, I was a baseball player, and I was done with that, and I wanted to spend my time thinking. And I found in my infectious disease clinic that I had to do a procedure that I had never heard of, which was called an anal pap smear, because there were so many people getting anal cancer who didn't know about it. And then we introduced this HPV vaccine, and we saw that the rates of anal cancer and other types of cancer plummeted. And so I am a very strong proponent of it. I know there are going to be people in the audience who aren't or, or aren't sure about it, but I think that it's been a wonderful addition. And New York Presbyterian, where I work, we have 
one of the world experts on HPV vaccine, a guy named Tim Wilkin. If anyone is interested, needs the vaccine or has questions about it, his last name is W-I-L-K-I-N. Adverse effects of vaccines are many. In fact, we have a whole compensation set system set up. Uh, I'm going to, in the interest of time, defer that conversation, but I will say that there is a ro robust discussion to be had about the risks and benefits of uh, these vaccines. And I have an observer bias, which is that I see the benefits of it. When somebody has an adverse reaction, they don't end up coming to me. So I admit my own bias. I saw this uh, YouTube ad of a, a man, his wife had uh, toe fungus. And the fungus went into her bloodstream and then it went into her heart and her brain and she was about to die. Now this man was a botanist, so he did a lot of research. And he said, how can something like a toenail fungus kill his wife and go into the heart and brain. So he did a lot of research and he found out like what is this fungus and he contacted a lot, of, he found out that a lot of people in the medical community could not answer his question about what is this fungus and how could this be. So he did a lot of research and he had found out that um, bacteria is a single cell organism and fungus is a multi-cell organism and that a lot of human beings have many, many uh, fungus in our body. And uh, he, he put together, we all are familiar with acidophilus, but he put together a herb called um, fungus eliminator that eliminates, uh, actually is, it has like seven other different acidophilus other in there, which I cannot pronounce. But um, he's saying that, you know, um, even people who had their toenail fungus surgically removed, the fungus comes back because it's something to do with our, a lot of fungus in our body. So Great question. Um, I mentioned that I'm the yeast infection guy, and it's because I was seeing things like this, where in medical school, people want to become brain surgeons and they want to become, you know, cardiologists. But I was seeing this very important subset of patients who were having things like toe fungus kill them. Nobody was talking about being that kind of doctor. That type of doctor is called a mycologist. And I ended up being drawn to a mycologist named Tom Walsh, who I mentioned at the outset of this talk, who I ended up writing the book about. And the fact that there are so few doctors who want to take care of patients with fungal infections, that what he's often left to do, and now what I do, is we will get frantic phone calls in the middle of the night from somebody who will say, I've got a 15-year-old girl who's got a toe fungus, and the fungus just got into her spine. What do we do? And that's what the book is about, how we have this very small cohort of experts to take care of this really important patient population. And the population is expanding because every time we come up with a new chemotherapy drug, every time we come up with a new drug like Humira, some new drug that can affect your psoriasis or your arthritis, it also affects your immune system and predisposes you to things like fungal infections. And we're not keeping up with the demand. And one of the ways that we're trying to alleviate this is with something which I think you hinted at, which is the probiotics. That there are ways with acidophilus and other types of, of good bacteria and good fungi that we can replace the dangerous ones. I will say that in the interest of time, that's an active area of inquiry, and that I'm not surprised that the toe fungus nearly killed this woman. The part that I spend a lot of time doing is going to medical students and residents around the country and pre-med people and trying to convince them that this would be a great career. Because there's nothing sexy about being the yeast infection guy, but it saves lives. And I appreciate your question. Hi, uh, thank you so much for all this information and your candor. Um, this isn't something that you hear from your regular do doctor or gastroenterologist or any specialist that I've ever been to. Um, so thank you for that. Um, my question, I had a couple of little questions, so I'm just going to lump okay. it all together. Um, during the AIDS crisis, I remember reading or hearing about um, drug therapies that skipped through that seven to ten year yeah. testing because of the urgency. Do you think that could be an option if there was some kind of a future superbug pandemic? And with, speaking of pandemics, I've read and you know, learned that it's 
many infectious disease specialists such as yourself, especially in New York City. I saw something on a, a, a female doctor in New York City who uh, is working on making a cohort of other hos all hospitals in New York City to have a database about different types of superbugs so that they can all be informed. And she was saying that it's not a matter of if or it's when. Absolutely. Uh, I just will answer that by saying we do have an accelerated pathway for the most promising drugs. It's still very slow because it just takes time. Um, you know, this Candida auris outbreak, for example, we decided we've got to find a new drug to treat people for this, and we found one. But it still takes time to make sure that it's not dangerous to give to humans. And one of the bizarre things in my field is that when we find a new antifungal drug, they give it a terrible name. So the new treatment for Candida auris is a drug called Ibrexafungurp. I don't know why they do that to us, but that drug is going through exhaustive clinical trials right now, and we created a network, which you alluded to, um, where we can recruit doctors and patients very quickly who are desperate to be experimented on. Um, it's a tricky thing because occasionally we will find that there are people who are so sick that we think they're going to die anyway. And we don't want to test a drug that's going to fail, but we also don't want to withhold a drug from someone. And this brings up a really controversial topic, this right to try, which I think people have heard about. And I can tell you, I'm able to simultaneously see it from the perspective of a doctor who's studying a drug saying, we shouldn't give this drug to people who don't qualify for it because it's going to screw up our testing and it's going to set the project back. And then I think about my children. And if one of them had a deadly disease and there was a drug that was being tested, I would fight like hell to get that access for them. So we go back and forth about the ethics of how quickly do we disseminate promising new drugs. I just had a question regarding a long time ago, about 10 years ago, I used to hear a lot about necrotizing fasciitis. Mm -hmm. fasciitis. And I'm just curious, I don't hear about it anymore. Is it still existent? Is it still prevalent? Because so, at, I worked in a hospital, yeah. and at that time it was. So the question is, so I, I'm seeing that my time is up, so I guess I need to stop on this question. But I will say, the question was, what happened to necrotizing fasciitis? This used to be something we heard about all the time. So that describes, essentially, flesh-eating bacteria. So necrotizing means that something's dying, and fasciitis means that it's the fascia, or the area just below the muscle and the skin that's dying. Necrotizing fasciitis is not due to a specific superbug, but encompasses a type of disease where you're constantly your skin is dying very quickly. Uh, I still see it all the time. Uh, people aren't writing about it as much, you're right. And the reason for that is that we know more. We're able to identify what the bacterium is that's causing necrotizing fasciitis. So sometimes you'll see that somebody will go um, into the Gulf of Mexico to go searching for squid or some, I don't know, whatever, and they come out and they have, uh, their arm is basically falling off. In the past, we would have said, wow, that person has necrotizing fasciitis. Now we say, that person has Campylobacter jejuni uh, infection, and we're able to give it a more detailed in answer. So that's why you don't hear about it as much. So on that uplifting note, <laughs> I just want to say thank you all for these wonderful questions and for listening to a talk about superbugs. So thank you.